Okay, welcome to the HRM chapter meeting. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us this evening. My name is uh, Donna Metot and I will be chairing the meeting. Now before I uh, introduce our guest speaker, I have a few housekeeping items. Uh, this is the last meeting until September 12th. Uh, the one hour presentation is webcast and archived at, on the uh, SSNS website. After a 10 minute break, uh, we'll have the chair's uh, year in review report and the treasurer's report. Then we will continue with the support segment uh, when we check in to see how people are doing and if they have any questions or concerns. And that last hour is, is not webcast. Uh, I'd also like to remind people that the Central Zone Mental Health and Addictions Program uh, would like uh, clients and family members who have used their services in the past year to take 10 to 15 minutes to complete a satisfaction survey. I have a few of them here tonight if you'd like to take them home or you can find them uh, at any of your uh, mental health clinics. This is for the Central Zone. Also there is a link uh, on the um, uh, mental Health and Addictions website, uh, you look for the satisfaction surveys. Uh, the surveys uh, are reviewed on a regular basis and your feedback is, is very important to improving the services. Lastly, I'd like to remind you to fill out the evaluation forms uh, before you leave this evening. Uh, if you are at home, you can just type in a little message uh, what you thought of the movie, uh, the movie, <laughs> the meeting, if you were satisfied or if you have any suggestions for topics or chain, changes you'd like to see, please let us know. Okay, so moving right along, I'd like to introduce Brad Rowe. Brad Rowe is uh, very well known in the mental health community. Brad is the Healthy Minds Navigator, so he is a wealth of knowledge and information and can give uh, a lot of uh, good direction to what services you may need or want. So welcome Brad and uh, really looking forward to hearing your recovery story. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to grab a seat. And I'd just like to thank Donna and the HRM chapter of the Schizophrenia Society in Nova Scotia for giving me this opportunity to share a little bit about myself. Um, I've been told that we are going to be interactive, which is good because I'm not a lecturing kind of person, so feel free to jump in anytime. Uh, I'm also going to apologize in advance because I haven't told my story in, in public for about five years. I share my story and perspective, pieces of it on a daily basis, but I haven't sort of put it all together. So if I forget something, I we'll be asking. <laughs> so, just, again, if you have a question, a thought, a comment, jump in. Uh, so, starting off with basically, most of my life has been covered by dysthymia, fueled by anxiety, and highlighted by points of major depression. Uh, my first documented episode of major depression was back in 1999. And I say documented because in retrospect, I know I've experienced that throughout my life, but this was the first time that I actually recognized that I was having some challenges. And was, this was the first time that I reached out for help. How old were you then, Brett? Oh, you're going to make me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I you was, can just give a ball. I, I was 33. Oh, okay. So that's rather late. Although you said this was and, 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 and documented. This, and, exactly. And this is this is the thing. For me, this was something, my, my normal wasn't helping. Uh, and this was, again, something that I hit that point where I, I was recognizing some symptoms and I reached out for help. Uh, again, retrospect, it's sort of, you know, this, this is something that's happened to me throughout my life. Uh, now, now this time, certainly I went to my doctor, like you're supposed to do. 
prescribed some antidepressants and they helped for a bit. But during that time, um, you know, I, I had some, some life changes. I had a seven year relationship that ended um, and my life was sort of spiraling down into, you know, it was work and sleep and I, I began to hate work. So I sort of hit that point where the medication was doing what it was supposed to do, but it wasn't enough. So I went to my doctor and asked for a referral. He gave it to me well, after I you know, broke down crying and you know, sort of proving, because he was really reluctant to. And he was really surprised when within a week I was actually seeing a psychiatrist. So you know, my first you know, kick at the can was you know, losing my job, my seven year relationship, you know, pretty much everything I had. Uh, but you know, the new year, 2000, new millennium, I was seeing a psychiatrist, I was feeling great, and I was cured. I was also on unemployment at that time, so I took a couple of months to enjoy myself. Uh, but I started seeing someone and she convinced me to, oh, that I should get back into life and get a job. So I found a job and things were going okay, except my normal wasn't really that healthy. You know, my again, I, I, I live with dysthymia. What's, what is dysthymia? I first this, had dysthymia to... is, is low grade depression. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I, sort of, I sort of describe it as, well, my experience with it was sort of like if you've ever been to a fireworks display and you're there and you know, you've got like the crowd and the noise and the, the lights and you know, just that overwhelming experience. For me, dysthymia was like, what being at home watching that on a black and white television but knowing what it's supposed to be like so like everything was really muted and so i gradually sort of started spiraling down again you know, went through a few relationships my life again once again began became sleeping and work um but this time you know when i recognized that i i hit that wall again I knew what to do. I went to my doctor, didn't have to cry this time, I got a referral, and I went through the day treatment program. So had to wait a few months to get in, but that's that, that's par for the course and with, 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 with the health system in general. So I went through the six-week program. Again, also at this point, I had uh, quit my job. I was on unemployment, sort of a pattern happening here. Uh, I basically I'd hit that point where I woke up one morning and I could not go to work. I had this, this just terror, this fear, I couldn't. And so I didn't. Uh, went through this program. I felt great. But, you know, five years earlier, I'd done the same thing, jumped back into life and ended up crashing again. So I knew something was missing, had no idea what, because, you know, I've done everything I was supposed to do. Went to the doctor, did this great program, did all the, you know, everything that, that you're supposed to do. So I sort of waited for the magic to happen, you know, that magic moment where it, it's going to be better. Because I, I was feeling better. I, I was, was experiencing, you know, symptom relief. I wasn't, you know, my anxiety wasn't through the roof. I wasn't suicidal any longer. It was, you know, that, that place where you're supposed to be good, but something was miss missing. So I decided I'll wait. I mean, I, I was on unemployment, so there was no real pressure to get back in. I'd left my job. Um, and for me, work had always been a problem, or it seemed to be a, a challenge of maintaining that enthusiasm. So I waited. Um, Do you mind if I ask what kind of work were you doing? I was working at a call center. Uh, for anyone who's in Halifax, it was Convergence. <coughs> so anyone who's had any experience with that, it was not a very rewarding kind of job. Right, it wouldn't be, yeah. yeah. But again, for me, again, work was always sort of that and I'm going to highlight work a bit because work was always for me. Again, I, and I, I guess because of my 
disinterest in life was you know, something I something that I took because I needed a paycheck. Yeah. I could do it and I could do it well. It's just yeah. it had no you know, there's no satisfaction. And then that became the focal point of my life. So you know, I sort of crashed again. I've gone through the day treatment program. I'm feeling better. I'm not cured anymore, but I, I'm feeling better. And I'm waiting for something to happen. And it didn't. Uh, now, that the time frame for, for me hitting that point would be around the end of 2006. So I waited for about a year. And then I started getting worse. Um, you know, sort of there, my unemployment ended, of course. I was still waiting. And I was sort of came to the conclusion that I've done everything I'm supposed to do, I've done everything that, that could be done, apparently. And you know, life was worthless and useless and I was hopeless. Were you still seeing the psychiatrist for I wasn't. Okay. No, the, I, I saw the psychiatrist for maybe two months back in 99, 2000. Uh, the, the second time around, it was basically a referral to the day treatment program here, which again, I, I, I went in feeling horrible and I came out feeling really, really good. What's involved with that program? What's well, involved with the program? Well, when I, actually, it's changed since I went through it, but basically, it's it's all group work. Mm -hmm. uh, it's developing life skills and coping skills. Uh, it's it's unique in that there's about 16 people that go through it, through the six week cycle. Uh, but people don't go in as a group, so you go in as an individual. So you could, you could, so I think I started at week five. Like the programming was on week five. Mm -hmm. And so the next week we finished and then some people went out and new people came in. But a lot of it is, it's surrounding, you know, some self-management skills and some goal setting. Um, I think they do some meditation and mindfulness now. Um, but again, it's, it's sort of sort of that group focus, a lot of coping coping skills and developing developing those skills to get through. I, I generally, it's it's people you know, it's usually mood disorders or persons who have reached a point of stability with with their symptoms. So, and it's a uh, and again, it's 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 all week. So you go. We were going. I think every like four and a half days a week. So I mean, it's 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 intense. very intensive, and it's <clears throat> now the, the challenge that I had sort of coming out afterwards was that I had gone I had a had, had gone from working to having a, a period of a few months of of having no structure to going back to having structure, which I for me I found helpful. You know, getting up and going there at eight in the morning and you know, having things laid out. And I guess for me, one of the one of the, the challenges of coming out of the out of the program was I don't have any structure anymore. You know, so so there's I, I, you lose that. I lost that. And like I said, for me, I felt better. You know, I was I was feeling good. You know, I I, I wasn't experiencing any acuity with the symptoms that I had previously experienced. I was in a good place. It's just I knew something was missing. And, and again, I was also in that place where, you know, I did everything I was supposed to do. I went to my doctor, I took the program, I was engaged, I did all this. And, you know, so I, I hit a point where I, this was, I guess, the best that I could expect. And I started going downhill. Um, and I waited, it was literally probably a year and a half of just sort of Puttering around waiting. Of course, when my unemployment ran out, mm -hmm. then I had the, the joys of having, you know, worked most of my life. I had a pretty good credit rating, so I had some credit cards. So, you know, I lived on my credit cards, so you know, paying my rent and food and all that stuff. Nothing extravagant, but that sort of is not really a good way to go. <clears throat> and then basically I hit a point where I, I really crashed. I just saw no point in being. It was, you know, my goal was to just not be here. Um, 
and that sort of set the tone for the next couple of years for me. That not wanting to live, having, having times where I wanted to die, but overall it was just that not wanting to live and not seeing any point. Not seeing, because you know, I've done everything. I mean, and at this point, I would, would have been, say in 2008, so I'm, I would have been, what, you're good at math, Todd? I was born in 66, so. So you're in your food. I was in your food. Yeah. And, and, so, and, and, yeah, and so I had lost everything, you know, yeah. and, I, and also you know, isolated myself, pushed everyone away. And so I, I figured, you know, I, I had no idea what to do. And so it was actually it was in probably January of 2008. I, I, I'm originally from Sydney. I moved up here in, in 1984 to go to university and stayed. And I had a nephew, and I've got some family up here, but I also, most of my family is, is down home. So I had a nephew who said, come on and stay with me. And so I said, you know, I hit that point where, sure, you know, I thought I'd go home and maybe that hope of maybe they can do something. Um, I can remember it was it was late January when I was driving down to Sydney and I'd sort of, you know, not really sure why I was going and knowing I didn't want to live in it, it almost felt like I was going home to die. And I can remember I was just outside of just outside of the deck. And I hit a whiteout, and I remember, you know, sort of that one moment of sort of pausing and saying, you know, maybe I should slow down. And then I just floored it, and just well, as fast as a Ford Focus can go in a snowstorm. But, yeah. <laughs> but I was, you know, in this way to going, you know, flooring the car, driving on the wrong side of the road, and it kept going until it cleared up enough that I could see and. Nothing happened, so I ended up heading to Sydney. And when I was there, I, I guess my expectation was, you know, I'm going to go home to family. And sort of one of the really paradoxical things with me was that the one thing I really wanted was for somebody to take care of me. Like I was struggling and suffering, I wanted somebody to take care of me. The other side of that paradox is that I pushed everyone away and I would not let anyone in. So I mean, I, I would be laying in bed crying, you know, you know, why doesn't anyone help me? Why, do, you know, one, yet I wouldn't be answering the phone. I would be ignoring people. People would, would try talking to me, and I would become very defensive. So it's that weird, I guess, the insidiousness of mental illness is that I wanted the help. I, you know, that's that was that I wanted it, but it wouldn't let me. And I say it because it sort of had a life of its own. So anyways, I, I ended up down at my nephew's, and I was there for, for a couple of months, but it was a really, really weird experience because you know, I hadn't lived in Sydney since about 1985. You know, I, I came up here from university, and I sort of went down one summer, went back home one summer, and never really came back. So, you know, roughly 30 years of not being there, coming home, and People just want to work their business. Like I'm living in, in the house with like my nephew and his wife and his couple of his kids and and, another, and his mother. So it was like there were five or six of us all there. And you know everybody knew why I was there. Everybody knew what I'd been going through. Yet we didn't talk. We didn't. You know it was that that big bubble that everybody walked around. And so I was there for a couple of months and I, I didn't get that. Help I wanted that I that I was expecting you know, to go home and be with family and have that, and I, I didn't experience that. So I had another nephew who was actually going to be heading out west. So he said I could stay at his house. I basically you know he would cover all the costs except for food. So I uh, went up. Could you back up just for a minute? Sure. What do you think in hindsight? Is there anything? That your nephew and his family, and or any of your family, is there anything that they could have done to to help you? Truthfully, do you, do you think? There's not because no. I, you know, I they they tried. I, I didn't know 
what to tell them. They didn't really know what to ask. They were, they cared, they were concerned, but it was this, you know, this whole, we don't know what, and there's that fear of, you know, you know, everybody thought I wanted to kill myself and nobody wanted to talk about it and they didn't know how. So for me, it was, you know, and then I, at that time, it felt like nobody cared. But I mean, I know now that, you know, it, it's just that, that huge, you know, nobody really knew how to, how to approach it. And, and again, I was in that place where just the thought of talking about it, my shame, the shame and guilt, you know, I was used, I felt so useless and worthless. And, you know, I was the person that they would come to for help. And now I'm not that. And so I would push them away. So, I mean, it was, it was this really, really dysfunctional dynamic because I wanted to help, they wanted to help, they were willing to, but we just couldn't find a way to communicate. And and again, I know a lot of that was was a product of me and not being open to the conversation at all. You know, I again the, the weirdest part was that I wanted to, but I would get defensive, I would push people away, and, and so it's it's this like I said this really weird dysfunctional dynamic, and you know. Nobody talked about mental illness in my family. You, know, you don't. Nobody talked about anything in my family. It's it's you know, anything of anything about you know, you know, Yeah, it, it was, there wasn't there wasn't that conversation around anything. So, so I mean that's that's sort of that that place where I went. I, I was coming home because I wanted the help. And they wanted me there because they wanted to help. We just we weren't connected. And it got worse because when I when I moved up to my my other nephew's place, basically there was me and a cat, and so for the better part of two years there was me and a cat. And you know, literally, you know, I'd go to the grocery store maybe once a week. Uh, now the grocery store was this small sort of corner grocery store that was probably maybe a hundred feet from where I lived where the house was, so it was sort of across the street and over just a bit. And it was really, I mean, a small kind of thing. And and for me, it was, that was that was my life. You know, I, the phone would ring and my, the way my anxiety was driving me, if the phone would ring, I would go to another room. I would avoid, avoid it at all, at all times. If somebody knocked at the door, I'd go hide. So, I mean, I was really, really pushing everything away. And at that point, my, my thoughts were really about not living and, and ending my life. <clears throat> and sort of one of the reasons I wanted to go to my nephew's place is that he's a hunter and he has rifles. So my thought was I could go there, I had the gun, and I could take care of it. But the guns weren't there. So my, my alternative plan was, and I don't want to get too, but it, it involved cutting my throat cutting the carotid artery specifically. So I, I ended up, you know, for about two years sleeping with a knife under my pillow, hoping that, that I had the strength, that I would wake up and have the strength to end my pain. I, I never did, but obviously. <laughs> Sorry, but, but, but I found like my, my days were spent, you know, just in, in that really weird place where day, I would lose days and our time with time was was wasn't wasn't really a relevant thing. And I would push people away. Like I, I can remember one time, my one of my sisters came to visit, and I hid in the bathroom, and closed the shower curtain, so that like they couldn't find me. I, I, that's that's sort of that that place I was in. I sort of define myself now when I wasn't well as as being sort of highly re reactive and and logically irrational. You know, doing these really stupid things. But then afterwards, when I would sit down and think about what I did, I would, I would beat up on myself because that's so ridiculous. I mean, hiding in the shower. But at that time, it was just that reaction to fear. So I, again, I spent about the better part of two years there, and you know, we never connected. You know, they, you know, we, we didn't do the Christmas thing or like, I, until finally I ran out of money. And I was, I was really desperate. 
So you know, going to the store with you know a handful of nickels, kind of kind of thing, and cashing in pop bottles to to, to get food. And I had a call from one of my my sisters in Halifax, and they got the impression that I was going to kill myself. Um, and then my nephew showed up, and he he said that they, they were concerned, and he said he wanted to take me to the hospital. I basically told him in my very defensive kind of pissed off sort of sort of attitude, yeah, let's go and I'll go there and I'll tell the doctor that yes, I am hopeless and feeling feeling that hopelessness and just despair. I don't plan on killing myself though. And then I'll come home and blow my brains out and you can live with that. Yeah, that's then he just sort of told me off and I ended up going down to his place for, for a little bit. Um, and again, this would have been around sort of 2009, late, late 2009 when that happened. And then I was there, but it was still that same sort of atmosphere. You know, we had that, that out, but nobody would talk, 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 talk about it, and I couldn't talk about it. But I was actually sort of starting to feel better because I, I wasn't dead. And I sort of woke up one day and realized, you know, I'm not dead. I, I guess I should do something about this. And so I basically I called my one of my sisters in Halifax and said, hey, have I got a deal for you? I'm going to come and live with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I haven't worked in, oh, you know, five years. I have no idea if I'll ever work again. <laughs> Oh, that's quite the deal. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, who knows how sick I'm going to get, but I'm comfortable with things up here, and I, I know the system here, and I, 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 can come, I know I can come up here and, and work towards getting better. And she said yes. So in February of 2010, I, I came back to Halifax. I spent probably about two, three months building up the courage to reach out for help. And it was a challenge. Because at this point, I, I didn't have a family doctor. Um, I had this real hate on for doctors. I, I didn't have a good experience with my family doctor. And I just felt, you know, I felt disgusted that I had to beg. And that's what, that's what it felt like to me, that I had to beg for help. Were you still taking medication? I wasn't. You weren't? You were? I, I weren't. And actually, I, I'm, I'm diabetic. Oh, okay. So I'd stopped all, I couldn't afford medication. So I'd stopped all my medication because I gave up. I didn't want to live. I had those, again, I had those moments where I wanted to die and I was sort of actively engaged in trying to make that happen. But I didn't want to live, so you know I stopped taking all medications, stopped eating, you know, eating properly, taking care of myself. I didn't care. My 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 end game was, you know, I, I had a good run at it. I'd done everything I could, so I just wanted to end. And so I, I came back and I went online to the Capital Health website and I saw that you could do a self referral because I, I didn't have a doctor. And I thought of going to a family doctor and trying to convince him that I to get me to help me. So I called up, and they told me, "Well, yeah, but you really need a referral from a doctor." And so I hung up the phone, and wow, it took me about another week where I was able to actually get out of bed and pull myself together. And I looked at some of the resources that were up there, and I, I called the, mo the mental health mobile crisis team, and they sent somebody over, and they gave me a referral to urgent care. I, I'm one of those people I had a really good experience with them. So I, I saw a social worker within a day at, at urgent care. I saw him for a couple of weeks. He referred me to somebody at, at, Bay at the Bears Road Clinic. I had to wait three months to see them, but 
but I was actually getting in there. And so when I, when I had my first meeting with the social worker, I, I was, again, I was in a really sort of pissed off, frustrated. I, I wanted help, but, you know, I had to wait, and why do I have to, you know, that, that whole I've been through here. I, I, was, I was angry. But she actually talked, and she talked through it, and she actually asked me what I wanted. And that, that was really the first time, you know, it's been almost a decade of connecting with the system. That was really the first time that somebody asked me what I wanted. And I had no idea. I just knew that symptom relief wasn't enough. I mean, that's why I said that, and I end up with a knife at my throat. So I needed more. And so she helped me. We talked. She actually referred me to a mindfulness group. And for me, that was actually, that was my vehicle for recovery. Mindfulness and, and mindfulness based cognitive therapy. Um, she also, another big thing that she did for me was she connected me with social services. Um, I hadn't even thought of it. And it wasn't about, oh, gee, I'm too proud to do that. It had not occurred to me that I, that I could be eligible for assistance, that there were supports out there that I could be taking medication. <clears throat> and she helped me with the paperwork. She talked to the caseworker. She even helped me overcome that big hurdle of needing a note from a doctor. She, she actually sort of co-opted one of the psychiatrists at the clinic to say, sign this kind of thing. And so I was able to get assistance. So I had a little bit of money, and I had access to medication. And that was, was such a huge thing for me. You know, to have a couple of dollars in your pocket to, go, to be able to go and buy a coffee. I mean, I'd spent most of my adult life working. You know, I paid my bills. I had that normal kind of, kind of expectation. And in the last five years, I didn't have that. And that was, it was a weight that was, that was taken off me. And with the mindfulness, that for me was, was a huge thing. Um, Did you do that in a group or just one on one with it, someone? It was it was in a group. There was actually, small group. Well, there were, there was there was an open group that met, and I, I started with that. And then there's a it's an eight an eight week mindfulness based cognitive therapy group that I attended, and there's about fourteen people with that. And for me. The big thing was, you know, it was talking about self-care and self-compassion. And one of the big things that I learned was that I didn't know how to feel. I didn't, I, I never felt. Um, and I learned how to feel. And I, I sort of point here because this is where I've always experienced things. And for, for as long as I could remember, this was just white noise. You know, when, when you'd see a therapist and they'd say, so how does that make you feel? My first thought was always, I'm not feeling anything. What's the right answer and, and what's the answer that you want? Because I, I wasn't feeling anything. And, and with, with, through, the, through mindfulness, I was able to learn how to feel. And it was probably one of the most painful experiences now everybody thinks meditation is about going into this wonderful place. The reality was that it's about being with all that stuff that I pushed down for 40 odd years. So it was really painful. But it didn't hang on, it didn't last. And I, I was able to go through it. And, and for me, again, th this, was my, this was my vehicle. And I ended up in the absolute, in a place I never dreamt of. Um, you know, I mean, talk about feeling better, recovery. This was a place I never dreamed knew existed. You know, I, I was experiencing things. And I knew that it really sort of, I, I guess, that magic moment I'd been waiting for, I knew it happened when I, it, was, it was actually Christmas time. And I hated Christmas. My, my family was a, a mess kind of thing, and Christmas is more a nightmare for me. And, you know, 
I experienced my usual anxiety, but then I, I enjoyed it. And I began to feel sort of a warmth here. And it's something that I, I late, it took me a while to, to really connect with it. And then I realized that this is something that I hadn't felt since my father passed away. So here I was, you know, 40 years later, feeling this. And this is where I knew, wow, this was this amazing place. Now, at this point, this was really just the start because you know, I'd spent most of my life with some level of, of mental health challenges and the last you know, decade, better part of a decade, actively struggling. And so every habit I had, everything I've learned, every experience I've had has been filtered through that, through the illness. And so now, you know, it's gone or, or I'm not experiencing it. And I'm in this really great place, but I have no idea how to live and it was terrifying. It was the, because I, I just didn't know. I was waiting for that, that shoe to drop. I was waiting for something to happen that, I guess the best way I can describe it, it would be all that background noise was gone. And I had no idea what life was like or how to live with that gone. And so it was terrifying, and, and the whole, what am I experiencing now, is this normal? And when I'm experiencing, going through the normal everyday things that, I, that I've always gone through before, but having a different flavor. And is this right, is this wrong, and that, that sort of thing. So that was a real challenge. Now, at this point, I, I was also sort of focused on, you know, I, I'm, I'm feeling better and I'm feeling really comfortable with where I'm at. I'm in this, this not just in this well, I'm in a great place. It's like I'm, I'm feeling it. So I started looking at, okay, the next sort of step will be getting back into life. Now, in the past, I would just, would just jump at it. Now I knew that, okay, I had to take my time. So I, I reached out to an organization called Teamwork Cooperative and sat down with them and said, hey, I'm 44 years old. Every job I've had, I've been really good at it. I've hated, and I've ended up getting sick. I have no idea who I want to be, what I want to be. Let's talk. And we did, and they worked with me, and they worked with me for about a year. Um, and so they, they helped you know, connect to me. And, and uh, again, that, that weird thing, the uh, experience of what do you want, which is something you know most people don't ask, they tell you what to do. And I ultimately, I've, al I've always sort of been that person that people go to, the problem solver, the helper for people. And so we discovered this thing called peer support, because I, I recognize that going to school and maybe doing a, a a master's of social work or like a, a, a psychology degree it's probably not something that I wanted to do because of I, I guess my my disconnect with the medical model and, and that system I the thought of going through you know seven and seven plus years of education and internship to be able to get to the point where I can do what I wanted to do wasn't appealing so we talked about peer support, and surprisingly, there's this organization that was located right next to the clinic called Healthy Minds Cooperative, and they're a peer-based organization. So I, I went there and became a member. I took some of the some of the workshops, which were fantastic because they were really in keeping with my own sort of learning to listen to myself and. The, the interest, self self determination and self guided living, self management that that whole perspective, and the other huge thing was that they got it. I, I I met people who I didn't have to explain myself to. Who you know, if I said I was having a bad day, it wasn't, go oh, gee, what you couldn't find your car keys. It was you know, I was having a bad day. And for me, that, that whole aspect of, of 
peer-based services, peer-based support, that, that connection was so amazing. So I was a member there and I took the workshops and then I had an opportunity actually through with teamwork to get a grant to work there. That and I so I started there at the end of November in 2012 and I've been there ever since. And, and for me, I guess the biggest thing is that, again, that place I've never dreamed of. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm working, and it is work at times, but I am working and I'm going to work and enjoying it. And I, I have a satisfaction. And it's, it's that, you know, that, that, that sort of cliche question of, gee, find a job that you do for free. Well, I, I found, sort of found it, and, and I had that. And so for me, that was you know, that moment where I, I, I knew things were going to be really good. Um, and, I, and I guess, you know, some of the big things that I, I picked up by being in the mental health community and, and working with people and through my own journey is that, you know, again, the, the insidiousness of mental illness. You know, I wanted, to, I wanted somebody to come and take care of me, and I could not let that. Um, it occupied every minute, every aspect, every molecule of my being. Now, and, and it took took me away. Um, I can't describe how how terrifying it is to lose yourself. I, I was an avid reader. I I I was the person when I in, in a previous job, you know, I was jug juggling a shift of twelve people and their vacations and everything, all in my head, and I couldn't remember why I went into the kitchen. I couldn't read a book. I couldn't even read a page. It took me away, and 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 it's just that that horrible insidious insidiousness that just leaches into everything. And I mean, I know I've had physical health conditions that have been have had a comparable impact on my life. Like back in 1990, I actually January 3rd of 1990, I was on my way to work. Slipped on some ice, wrenched my back, and ruptured a disc. I was off work until well, probably about seven or eight months. I ended up having back surgery in that that October, and I had the experience the most excruciating, persistent pain. You know, the painkillers didn't work unless they knocked me out. Not, nothing really worked, but it was this constant pain. And even with that intent, I mean, this like if you can imagine, you know, the pain sh just just like picture having a toothache from here down. And I would live through that a hundred times over before going through even a portion of what I did with mental illness, because you know those those eight months that I was off work and and I mean. I can't even begin to describe the pain, but I was still me. I could have my friends over, have a beer. I was still Brad. You know, I could cook a meal. I could read a book. I could watch a movie. I could enjoy, or well, what I what I do. I was me. I, I had a lot of challenges, and there was things that I couldn't do, but I was me. And when I wasn't sick, when I was sick with, with, because of the mental illness that I was dealing with, I wasn't me. I, I was just this hollow shell of, of something. And like I said, I, I would go through that pain a hundred times over before having to go through this again. And, and, and to me, that's, that's the worst part is that when I was getting better, that fear of what am I going to lose? Am I going to be able to read again? Am I going to be able to think? Who am I going to be? 
And, and it's scary because, I mean, I was 44 starting from basically from day one. And I recognize that there are all these things that, you know, it's great that I'm not experiencing the acuity of the symptoms. But, you know, I, I think, I mean, as I mentioned before, my whole life was focused and filtered through that illness. And everything that I learned that kept me alive, I still had those habits. I didn't, I didn't have the cause of them, but I still had those habits. So I had to you know, unlearn them and relearn and learn all these new skills. So I mean, I'm 44 and I can't sit down and talk to someone. I don't know how to make small talk. I'm afraid of you know, social interaction. I don't have those skills. I had them. I don't have them anymore. You know, and and so for me it was that you know you know the symptom relief, you know the the stabilization, all that is great. But it's that start. It's that's not the end game. That's just the start. And it, it was scary. It was I, you know, to lose and to be afraid of who I might might be coming out the other side. How long did it take you to get beyond that? It was well, it was about a year, but and I was working with with Teamwork Cooperative. I, at that time, I was also I was also volunteering and doing work with the mindfulness group and, and the NPCT programs. I was doing some stuff with with Healthy Minds. I was I, I was I was engaged. I was involved in things, um, but it was it was probably about a year. Of, of sort of getting getting to there where I felt felt comfortable, and even even after that, it was still still that you know recovering and relearning some things, um, and it was also sort of accepting the fact that I, I did change because of this. I, I don't read anymore. I can read and I can comprehend. I just don't read anymore. I I, I was the you know, go to the library, take out the six books in the series and binge for the weekend person. And I haven't read a book and just lost interest. Yeah, and it doesn't hold that same thing. But I, I think that's that's pretty normal because as we grow and we experience new things, we, we change. But I think that that's also can be, can be a fear because I was identified as the reader. That was who I was and that's not who I am anymore. Um, I guess the other sort of big thing for me was when I stopped asking why, the change started happening. I stopped asking, you know, why, why am I, why am I going through this? Why me? And and it started asking what? What am I experiencing? What do I need? And, and what can I do? And I, and I found that shift made a huge difference because when we focus on, on the illness and we get into the blame and the guilt and then that cycle and just live there and it's easy to live there. I live there. And, and for me, it really, I guess, things really began when I started, I guess, taking, taking some ownership of my life, you know, recognizing that I don't like where I'm at. I have no idea how to get out of here, but I know that I have to do something. And, you know, in the past, it was all about going to the experts, doing what they said. And that's great when you're dealing with an acute illness. You know, I break my arm, I go to the hospital, they do their thing, it heals. And as long as I'm not stupid enough to do something, you know, to aggravate it, it's fine. With mental illness, you know, while we, I think, I guess one of the things that I think that I concluded was that, you know, while we treat it based on acuity, we usually don't seek help until we're acute. It's not an acute illness. It's it's really a chronic illness. 
and, and with a chronic illness, the relationships are different. It's, you know, you have to become involved. You have to become engaged. You have to be a participant to get well. Somebody can give you meds to take, to, you know, to help manage your, your symptoms, but that only helps so much. And, and I guess for me, again, you know, one of the most insidious parts about mental illness is that my experience, in order to get well, you have to be involved. And mental illness takes away your capacity to participate. So you can't help yourself. You can't engage when you're at your worst. Mm -hmm. And and I think you know we, we tend to look at symptoms and treating symptoms, and then it's great. Except, it, it, you know, in my experience, it wasn't that I have to like live. Um, I guess another sort of sort of big thing was semantics. Um, I would always get in that argument when, <clears throat> when people started talking about responsibility. I would always sort of go to the well, yeah, I, I did that, but I'm sick, and you know, I, I mean, I was really sick, and. So you get into that whole internal debate of, you know, yeah, I did something that, that might have been wrong or painful or caused, you know, caused me hurt to someone else. And it's certainly something that I wouldn't really want to do, but I did it. I accept that I did it, but I was sick. And I would stay there. You know, the validating the why because of, you know, I was sick. And for me, Switching from responsibility to ownership was was a huge thing. You know, I, I can take ownership of. I, I did these things. I know I did them. I certainly wouldn't do them now, but at that point, I did them, and I didn't blame myself. And it wasn't that big blame. So for me, ownership was 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 a word that helped. Um, and again, I mean, it's semantics. I mean, you know, there is, there is that accountability and responsibility with it. But it helped me work through that whole defensiveness. Another thing I found was choice. You know, when people tell you this was your choice, and well, yeah, it was, but again, that whole, I'm sick, I, I know I was behaving irrationally, I made stupid decisions. Again, it comes down to that, that big argument that kept me there. So for me, I, I talk about options. You know, at that point, I made a choice, but it was based on the options that I was able to see. And again, it's semantics, it's you know, it's just a word, but it pulled me away from that conversation and allowed me to move forward. Um, another big thing for me was acceptance. The, you know, I blame my mother. She caused all my problems. She did cause a lot of my problems. <laughs> but but you know, I, I found the blame. You know, at first you blame yourself because you're wrong, you're bad, there's something wrong. And then, wow, you know, you find the cause and oh, so it was your fault. So you blame somebody else and you feel better. So it takes a little bit of that burden off you. But then it doesn't take it all away, so you start blaming yourself again. And you get in this cycle of, of blaming. And, and for me, acceptance, and I, I learning that acceptance is just, this is what happened. And again, moving away from the why to, to what. What are you feeling? What do I need? What can I do? And moving away from that whole cycle of blame and and and, and trying to find the cause. You know, we, we want to we want to know the cause, the reason. And you know, we can point fingers and we can get so caught up in analyzing and you know, going through every moment and deciding who was right and who was wrong and getting <clears throat> caught up in all that. And staying there. So for me, it was getting some distance by 
learning that acceptance is just, I hurt, it doesn't matter why I hurt, I hurt. And this is what I need to do. Um, another sort of big thing for me was I expected it to just happen, bang. It's going to be this one big, you know, give me the pill and I'm done and it's going to be great. And I realize now that, you know, this is a marathon. It takes a long time. And, you know, there is no, you know, it's going to be three weeks, eight weeks, ten years. It could be whatever it takes for you. And for me, I found I spent a lot of time focusing on that down the road when I'm better or when I have this, it's going to be. And not living and not experiencing and not being with what was going on. So for me, I learned to really embrace the small victories. Because there was a point where my big goal was when you wake up, have a shower. As simple as that. And that's about all I could do. I noticed that you know, it had been a, about a week since I had, had a shower. And I, I, and I noticed that, okay, I, this wasn't right. I didn't want to do this. So my goal, my big goal was when you wake up, have a shower. And there were days where I didn't accomplish that goal. But there were days when I did, and it became a success. And it became a habit. And then it became all. Well, when you wake up and after your shower, have something to eat. So I had those tiny victories, those wins. I had some success that I was having an impact on. You know, it was, you know, in, I, I couldn't change the change my world, but I could have a shower. And it went from, you know, having the shower to having a meal to finding a job. And, and moving forward. So creating a foundation. But it really, for me, it was about embracing the, those tiny things. And, and I discovered that you know, it's those thousand tiny little steps that, that allowed me to get well. And, and the other big thing that I learned was slow is really good. Taking my time, allowing the time for something to become a habit, to become, for me to become comfortable with it, for me to sort of bring that into, in, into my, my, my sort of, what's the word, Todd? My lexicon of, of activities and sort and, and building that foundation and having something to build on and, and having, having that, that go-to thing. That was there. So rather than you know jumping back into work, it was I'm going to volunteer for you know one day a week just to see how I feel. And it was really about you know, learning to listen to me and allowing the time. And I guess and I'm sort of what time is it? Almost eight. Okay, so I'll I'll wrap up with maybe one last thing, if that's okay. Okay. Um. I think for me the biggest thing was when I stopped focusing on the symptoms and stopped trying to fix something and started focusing on trying to live. Because I, I learned that, you know, if it's all about the symptoms and all about that the illness, that that take that becomes your life. But if it becomes about wanting to live, even if that's, you know, one day this week, I can do something, then that's living. And because I've discovered that recovery has its own unique flavor and its own meaning for everyone. There's no, bang, you fit in a box and you're recovered. Everybody has their own place. Everybody has a different page, their own, their own different 
take on things. And you know, at the end of the day, it's for me, it's really about you know, trying to have some quality in my life. And I, and I found by focusing on that, rather than focusing on fixing my illness, that I was able to move away from it and, and actually move into a good place. Thank you so much. Yes. That's, it's quite a powerful, yes, powerful yeah. story. And, uh, Do you have a question? Will you take questions? Sure. Or? Yeah, I was wondering, to me, I mean, it seems like a, a, a real workable process that you have developed. And the attitude of, you know, forget about trying to fix things and just live your life is... Uh, a, a very good approach to dealing with mental illness. Uh, is there any kind of program available that sort of helps to, like we always said that there should be some sort of mental health rehab. You know, when somebody's had a crisis and then is recovering and stable, that there should be some sort of no. recurring type of... There's not I guess a program, a place that you can go and, and get that. I, I think, you know, again, from recovery to discovery, the conversation, I mean, recovery is self-determined. It's this is what I I I I want. And it's the focus on that. Um, so I mean like, sort of pulling the pieces together, like from recovery to discovery, for me, I found to be a huge benefit. Um, it was going to a place that was safe. It was getting out at night. I mean, I, I, I was, at, at that time, you know, I was still struggling going to Walmart. So going to a place where I felt welcome and I felt safe. And the other big thing, again, for both that group is that it's not about sitting down and talking about how horrible my life is and, you know, having everybody tell me what to do. It's, let's go and discuss a topic or let's have a presentation. It's normal, but it's safe and it's still engaging. So I mean, something like that. Another, one of the things that I found really helped was sitting down and looking at a wellness plan. Now, one of the ones that I found to be really helpful, the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance, has has a has a wellness plan called Next Steps, and it frames. Sorry, sorry, it's the it's the next. Step. It's called Next Steps, but I mean any wellness plan because it starts with you know, what does wellness mean to you, and it starts talking about the the steps that you can do and, and that you identify. So it's not you know a doctor telling you that okay you have to do this. It's me sitting here saying okay. I've got to take care of my personal hygiene and doing that. And by engaging and by participating, it's 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 that it, it's empowering. You know, because I mean the reality is that you know you go to a doctor's appointment, you still have 167 hours that week that you have to live. And and so it's 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 reaching out and finding things like that. Um, again, there's not really a program that I that I'm aware of that that does that. I think you know there are there are aspects of that around. And I mean, are you familiar with anything, Todd, that might? Well, I mean, well, the day treatment program potentially can do that. There's a two week version for some folks, and then there's a six weeks version. What is the, the mental health day treatment program? Oh, the day two. There's a two-week version, which is, I believe, actually for addictions, and then there's the six-week, more intensive version. Yeah. Um, they're, they're actually two completely different programs. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, I mean, the mindfulness program that Brad went through, I went through that too. Brad was actually part of that uh, at Bayer's Road. So the clinics have different programs that are available to people. Part of the problem is that there's nothing comprehensive yeah. that is fully engaging for a person. A program that exists over here is a place that you have to get up and go to every week. Yeah, and, and the other, I guess, that's part of the challenge, of course. The, the other big thing would be that clinics don't have open groups. So you have to be seeing a clinician, getting a referral. 
And, and the thing is, you know, that's six weeks. So there's nothing that sort of, well, I need a refresher that I can pop in. But I, I think it's, it's, for me, it's, it's really about cultivating that attitude of, you know, what do you want? What, what do you view as your goal? And then talking about informed decision making. You know, I want this, well, okay, how are you going to get there? And it's having that conversation and engaging people. With um, who? Hmm? Who do you have that conversation with? Who do I have that? Not you. Who would, who would the average yeah. person have? Yeah. Well, with you, I think, You, you can have that with me. But there's also a, a program called Your Way to Wellness. It's a it's the Stanford University Chronic, uh, chronic Disease Self-Management Program. And it's about, you know, taking, take, I, I, hate, I almost say control, and I hate, I hate the word control, because it's, it's engaging and, and being a part of your, your managing a chronic illness, and it's it's free. It's, a, it's, it's online. A, well, no, it's a yeah. it's a program that's offered offered through the health authority. It's oh. it's a six week program. They had offered it a couple of times through the community health teams. Um, but I mean, if if you if you Google your way to wellness, yeah, it's, yeah, through, it's, of it. it's throughout the province, and it's really about engaging engaging you in you know, the reality that the relate when you're dealing with a chronic illness your, your relationship with the service providers is different they provide education you provide the management yeah you know, so they're there to, to tell you sort of best practice and give you advice but you make the decisions and you know versus again you know you break your arm you go in they x-ray it there's reasonable expectations surrounding recovery, and basically, as long as you know, follow instructions, it's good. And, and, and I can guess for me, accepting that that you know, I have something that I'm going to—that's part of me. Like I know now that <clears throat> you know, nine, in 2000, I was cured, and I, I wasn't because this has been built into me. It's part of my my day-to-day -day strategies and i've noticed that you know these are things these are places that i do go to i still you know have those low low moods i still have have those things that are happening the difference now is, is my relationship to it you know the, the ups and downs have now become twists and turns and they're far farther apart now but they're there and being aware that, you know, if I don't take care of myself, that this is where I can go. You know, I find I, I was doing some work with somebody who had spent he'd been in another hospital for years, and until he finally connected with the idea, he sort of, he sort of gave in, I guess, and started taking his medication on a regular basis. Because that was always his thing. It's like, you know, I being told I had to take my meds, I'm fine, I don't need that. And he would go through that cycle of mm -hmm. getting better or well, having having some sort of symptom relief. Just starting to get into life and then ending up hospitalized. And he had, it's been about probably about two years since he's been hospitalized now. He accepts the fact that, you know, the medications are doing are helping me to live. You know, he accepts the fact that you know when he wakes up in the morning, it takes him a couple of hours to get going. You know, the side effects of some of the meds he's taking. But he sat down and he was you know he sort of looked at the benefits versus the negatives. You know the, the negative side effects versus the positive side effects of his medication, and being able to go out and have a life. Is a lot better than you know, ending up in the hospital and then you know, trashing your life and going through that. But it took him years to get to get there. And and it was that shift in, okay, I want a life. And you know, yeah, it costs me because you know there's some side effects. 
but there's a bigger cost to not to not doing this, and it's a and it's a price I don't want to pay. But it's it's sort of coming to that and, and looking at you know coming back to you know what do I want, and what what can I do to get there? You know, I'm diabetic. I you know I'm jabbing myself with a needle a couple of times a day. I would prefer not to, but it beats it beats the alternative. And you know for me the reality of being well, and you know, if you've ever had a hypoglycemic moment, you know, it, it's something that I, I wouldn't recommend. And you know, to have that stability is worth it. I mean, you know, seriously, you know, three needles a day in my stomach is not not fun. And there are days I don't want to, but it's better, and it's a choice that I'm making. You know, because I, I, I've I've experienced the alternative. And I know that I don't want to go there. And, and the reality is that when I stopped actually thinking about it and started focusing on the, you know, I'm going to have some cheesecake, that that it's that, that you know the fact that I have to take a needle and maybe you know up my dosage a bit isn't a big deal because it's just part of part of my normal life. And it's again, it's that focus. Moving away from the illness and the symptoms. Well, we want to uh, express our gratitude for you to come. This was a really a very insightful talk, yes. and um, especially when it comes to you know communicating with people who who live with a mental illness and your approach that you've given us is going to be very beneficial to so thank you no thank Brad you. thank you very much thank you Brad <laughs>